Good morning, church. So when the prophet Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to anoint a king over Israel, this is what the Lord said to him in 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but catch this, the Lord looks at the heart. In the New Testament, the Pharisees were constantly trying to find ways to appear outwardly holy without ever having a true transformed heart. We can only come to a complete surrender to the Spirit of God when God changes our hearts. And then, through that heart change, we become authentic, true worshipers. Catch this. Religion promotes self-effort and actually defiles a person. Because religion can only address behaviors. But a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ changes our hearts and then makes us free so that we can love him and worship him for who he is. And again, none of this can happen without a complete heart change. You can't fix the old one up. Listen to this statement and think about it as we go through this message. It has been said that the wicked think their sin is nothing. The moral think that their sin is small. And the religious think that their sin is manageable. But all sin is against God, and only He can cleanse and transform us. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 7 as we continue in that verse-by-verse -verse study. Last week, let me catch up real quick. Remember that immediately after they had finished serving the crowd, Jesus made the disciples get in a boat and go over to the other side of Bethsaida without him while he was up on a mountain praying. And in the middle of the night, it, we're told that the disciples were straining at rowing. And Jesus is up there praying, but he was well aware of what the disciples were going through. Jesus is always present. All Jesus is waiting for is us to cry out to him for help. And at this point of the narrative, this is where Peter asked Jesus, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. But Mark kind of omits that part. Out. And so Peter displays this radical faith when Jesus said, it is I, come. Peter gets out of the boat and only the second man in all of history walks on the water until he looks at his surroundings. He looks at the waves and the wind and he begins to sink. But after the boat arrives, break time's over. Because as soon as they get out of the boat, everyone recognizes who Jesus is and they come running to him. They want a touch from the Savior. They want a miracle from the miracle worker. And what we learned finally last week was with our failures, the Lord is faithful to forgive us and not only forgive us, but turn the situation around to work out for our good and his glory. And so this morning, this morning could be taken as a real spanking if you take it that way. And, and yet there's bad news and good news. There's bad news to those who want to live the self-righteous life thinking that they're going to make it somehow on their own. But there's good news for those of us who are in Jesus Christ knowing that Jesus did it all. He did it all. And so these Pharisees come 70 miles. What did they travel so far to do? To simply correct Jesus. They travel 70 miles to give Jesus a do-better talk. Imagine this scene. And what was the do-better talk all about? That his disciples actually had the audacity to eat without properly cleaning their hands. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, the accusation. The accusation, if your Bibles are open, Mark chapter 7, begin at verse 1. It says, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk 
catch this, according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. Think about this. Have you ever met a person that comes to you with a question that's really not a question at all? Right? I have a question for you. And before you get the answer out, right before then, they already have eight more questions and nine more comments because what they're really wanting to do is argue. They don't have a question at all. You know, I can refute whatever you say. They're just waiting for you to take a breath so they could just jump down your throat. Well, in Mark chapter 7 here, this is the second time that a delegation has come from the Pharisees. And this time they travel 70 miles and they've heard of all these miracles. They've heard of all the feedings. They've heard of all the healings. And yet what they're concerned with is that you eat with dirty hands. Now, at face value, the Pharisees were in charge of making sure no false doctrine went out to the people. So kudos to them for wanting to make sure that whatever this Jesus guy was teaching went along with Scripture. But they ignore all the healed sick people. They ignore all the people who have eaten bread, all the thousands of miracles. And what they want to debate is whether or not they washed a specific way. Not whether their hands are clean. Did they wash in a specific way? They're breaking the traditions of the elders. It's important to remember this happens immediately after the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. And they don't come to refute the miracles. They come to argue about traditions. There in your notes, Jesus meets the people's needs, but the religious leaders were more concerned with appearances and rules than the needs of the people. Again, notice the question, not why did your disciples break biblical law? That was not the question. The question was, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? Has zero to do with scripture. Hear this. We have to be so careful judging other people's worship styles just because they're different than us. The methods of how we worship and the method of how we get the gospel out can change all the time, as long as it doesn't go against Scripture. Now, there were two books that the Jewish leaders relied on in addition to the Old Testament. They were the Mishnah and the Talmud. The Mishnah contained oral traditions, and the Talmud was a commentary on the Old Testament Bible. Listen to what the Talmud actually said. The Talmud said, the words of the scribes are lovely above all of the law. L let me repeat that again. The words of the scribes are lovely above all the words of the law. There in your notes, not only did these religious leaders place a higher value on traditions than people's needs, they also placed a higher value on their traditions above the word of God. Their rituals would tell you this. First thing you got to do when you wake up in the morning, you got to get up and you got to go do some ceremonial washings. Because while you were sleeping, you may not have known that actually a spider came near you and defiled you. So you need to go and, you know, wash your hands and make sure you're not defiled. Think about this. If we go along with their thinking, what they probably would have told Jesus was, you know that crowd out in that deserted place that needs to eat those 5,000 men plus women and children? Make them walk four miles to town and do ceremonial washings before you feed them. I don't care how hungry they are. They got to go back to town. They got to wash them hands. This is what William Lane said. The hand washing described here was purely ceremonial. It had nothing to do with having clean hands. In fact, they would wash their hands before they would do ceremonial washings. The washing of their hands, it was such a ritual. They would take about an eggshell and a half of water and they would pour it from the fingers down to the wrist, each hand. Then they would take their fist to clean their palms and then they would take that amount of water again. And this time they would wash from the wrist down to the fingers. No matter how clean your hands are, if you don't do this, you're eating with dirty hands. And again, the problem is not a dirty body part. The problem is not an outward appearance because religion can take care of that. The real problem that separates us from Jesus Christ is a dirty heart. And it takes something bigger than tradition to wash that. 
through the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ and the new heart that he promises to all who would receive him. That's how we become undefiled. That's how we come into relationship with him and receive new life. This is what Warren Wiersbe said. These washings not only indicated a wrong attitude towards people, but they also conveyed a wrong idea of the natural sin and personal holiness. Jesus made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that true holiness is a matter of the inward affection and attitude, not outward actions. There in your notes. Jesus taught that a person who obeys the law externally can still break the law in his heart. And that external defilement has little connection with the condition of the inward person. So the Pharisees are more concerned with keeping traditions than, than with people. But instead of Jesus denying, and I love how Jesus does this, instead of denying that he broke traditions, he decides, I'm going to show you that it's a matter of the heart. Roman numeral two. So Jesus rebukes the hypocrites. Look at verse six. And he answered and said to them, Jesus' words in red. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift of God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your traditions you have been handed down, and many such things you do. So Jesus, in his answer, he says, here it is. Here's the real problem, religious leaders. There in your notes. The real issue is not the dirty hands of the disciples, but the real issue was the dirty hearts of the religious leaders. There's the real problem. And remember, they came to Jesus with the accusation, your disciples are breaking traditions. And the Pharisees asked Jesus, why do you allow them to break these traditions? So Jesus answers them like this. Why do I let them break traditions? Why do you break the law of God? What do you say to that? So he, he begins this rebuke by using the word of God, and I love that. He quotes from Isaiah, and then from the law which is written in Exodus and Leviticus. It, it's basically as if Jesus was saying, if you want to come to me with an accusation, chapter and verse, please. Show it to me. And, and just imagine these religious leaders. You wonder why they wanted to kill him. But what a perfect argument. They can no longer take the religious higher ground when the Son of God points to the, to the Old Testament and says, chapter and verse, show me what's more important, your tradition or the Word of God. And he pulls no punches and he calls them, imagine this, the religious leaders of the day, they insisted on respect and he says, you are hypocrites. Imagine. It, the word in the Greek means an actor or a stage player, a pretender. That's what hypocrite means in the Greek. Back then in the theater, an actor was given two masks. And what they would do is they'd play two parts. They're playing one part, they'd put a mask up. They're playing the other part, they'd put the other mask up. Think about this, there in your notes. Once we are in Christ, we're a new creation. When we behave like the old man we were before Christ, we are a play actor which is the very definition of a hypocrite. When we act like somebody we're not in Christ, when we act like that old person, we're actually putting on a mask and playing the hypocrite. And Jesus tells these religious leaders, you know, that prophecy in Isaiah 29, 13 was written about you. These men are like professional Christians. They know all about the Lord they just don't know the Lord. And, and so let's talk real quick about the three things that he accuses them of. 
The first one is, they honor me with their lips. What he's saying is, there is no connection between the words that you say and what's really going on in your life. You honor me with your lips, but with your heart, you're far from God. I can't hear what you're saying because I see your life. The second one's even worse. In vain, they worship me. Vain worship, what does that mean? Well, the dictionary definition of vain means useless. Catch this. They were practicing religion and Jesus is telling them, your whole religion, your whole worship of God is useless. And again, you wonder why they wanted to kill him. Imagine how angry they would be. Since I was a little kid, I've been practicing Judaism. And you're telling me that everything that I've done towards God is worthless. Your whole life's accomplishment, useless. And, and why was their worship useless? Because the third one, because you're teaching man's doctrine as Bible truth. You're teaching traditions as Bible truth. Uh, again, they valued their traditions over the very word of God. Now, this is key. And, and I thought about that this week and I thought, man, why was that so harsh? Well, here it is. This means that true worship is connected to true Doctrine. True worship, authentic worship, is connected to true doctrine. Biblical doctrine is important for every Christian, every Christ follower. We might say, oh, that's no big deal. So they this and so they that. No, it's a big deal. And let me explain. Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the Lord is saying authentic worship is connected to not only the word of God, but to true doctrine. So if we see something that's not normative in scripture, it should not be practiced in a worship service. Period. End of sentence. But then Jesus gives them another example of their hypocrisy. Look again at verse 11. And he says, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin. That is, it's a gift of God. What's Corbin? Great question. So glad you asked. <laughs> Corbin was where they would dedicate an offering to the temple. And these leaders, basically what they would do is they would offer an offering to the temple, but they'd hold on to the money. So let's say I got... $5,000 in the bank. What I would do is say, I am dedicating that to the temple the day I die. So my mother or my father would come to me and say, Rich, I have a need. And I would say, oh, I'm so sorry. You see, I've given that as a Corbin offering so you can't have it. What they were doing was selfishly keeping their money and claiming it as a Corbin offering. So if there was truly a need from their parents, they could turn them down. And what he does is he uses the law of Moses and says, honor your mother and your father. What do you mean? You guys use this fake Corbin offering to say you're so righteous so people around you go, oh my gosh, they dedicated 5,000 to the temple. Aren't they righteous? Aren't they wonderful? And they would use this excuse while selfishly keeping the money for themselves. This is what J.R. Edwards said. A man goes through the formality of vowing something to God. Not that he's going to give it to God, but in order to prevent someone else from using it. They were making the word of God of no effect because of all their rituals and traditions. And they were making the Bible null and void is basically what they were doing. Catch this. Rituals without a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ are worthless. A relationship is always the way to God's heart. There in your notes, without a personal relationship with the Lord, our rituals are good for nothing. The traditions of man should never be given higher precedence than the authority of the word of God. You see, if you want to test false religions in the world, it's pretty simple. 
This is how you test false religions in the world. Number one, what do they do with Jesus Christ? If they try to diminish the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a false religion. But the other thing that they do is they're always out for money, prestige, and power. That's how you can tell. God's word always goes against the selfishness of man. Always, every time. God's word is always contrary to the natural man. Leaders of these false religions are seeking power and riches and pride and all these things. But the word of God tells us this. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word of God always hurts natural man because we want, we're selfish, we want pride, we want power, we want position, we want all those things. Now, I got to take a time out because a lot of us come from liturgical churches where there's all these traditions, Lent and all these different things. Traditions in themselves are not bad. They're not. It's what we do with them. All right, so how defilement really happens. Roman numeral three, look at verse 14. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said, hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So what happens is Jesus just tried to explain to these Pharisees what the deal is, and they're having none of it. So he goes, okay, I'm wasting my breath. This is 10 minutes of time. I'll never get back. So instead of teaching the religious leaders, he goes to the crowds. And what he's saying is all the traditions in the world, all the ceremonial hand washing in the world will never clean your dirty hearts. There in your notes, what comes out of our mouth reveals if we have a dirty heart. You see, there are people who want to use performance or, or traditions, and they want to try to appear righteous before God, but it won't work. And I thought about this when, when Jesus says, what defiles you? What does defile mean? Defile means to make common, unclean, or to render unhallowed or profane. Catch this. Something is defiled when we don't dedicate it fully and wholeheartedly to the Lord. There in your notes. We are not defiled by things from outside the body. Thoughts of murder, evil intentions, and what comes from the heart defiles a person. Not eating with dirty hands. Chuck Spurgeon said, murders begin not with the dagger, but with the malice of the soul. In Acts chapter 10, there's a great story of how the apostle Peter, you know, thought he was so clean and everything else. And God lowers down this sheet with all these unclean animals. And God says to Peter, Peter, rise, kill and eat. This is what Peter said. Love Peter. Acts 10, 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. That's defiled. It's not defiled if I've cleansed it. Later, again, love Peter. Peter was eating with some Gentiles, and then some of these Jews came from Jerusalem and came down. And as soon as they show up on the scene, Peter's like, I'm not eating with Gentiles anymore. Some of my Jewish brethren are here. It's what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Verse 13. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Old religious traditions are hard to break, are they not? And the emphasis is always on external things. You know, I, I go to temple every Sabbath. I, I do this. I give. I, 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 I. But could you recognize something that's being said in every one of them sentences? I. They have a real I problem. I this. I that. And the Lord's saying, none of that makes you righteous. So... 
Here's some great news and some horrific news in point number four. Jesus explains the parable further. Look at verse 17. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Eat whatever you want. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach. And it's eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within, and that's what defiles a man. So what he's saying is, hey man, you want to eat bacon? Get after it. <laughs> that's the Rich O'Toole version. There in your notes, it's easier to keep rules and traditions than to change our rebellious hearts and enter into a relationship with God. So first, some bad news and then some good news. We have this whole list of things that Jesus just said. This is what comes out. This is what comes out. This is what comes out. And so let's talk about a few of those things, because this is bad news for some, but it's great news for others. Nate Holdridge said, Jesus said that the sinful heart produces sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, just in case you were wondering, covers any sexual activity, thought life, anything outside of biblical norms, okay? Sexual immorality. But Jesus cleanses us and gives us a new heart. Jesus said the sinful heart produces theft. Before Jesus changes your heart, Right? Think about this. We were bound to take something that wasn't ours. We were bound to be lazy at work. We were bound to cut corners. But when Jesus changes your heart, he turns that idea of theft into generosity. And we want to give to others. Jesus said the sinful heart produces murder and takes the life of the innocent. It's like Cain wanting to kill his brother. But when Jesus changes our hearts, we begin to build others up placing them higher than ourselves. There in your notes, Jesus said the sinful heart produces adulteries, and we must be careful because everyone is capable of causing long-term pain in exchange for short-term pleasure. When Jesus changes our heart, self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit, and he gives that to us when we're saved. Jesus said the sinful heart Produces covetousness, which is a desire for the exploitation of someone else's goods, having more than we should. But when Jesus changes our heart, this is when we be content with what he has given us. Jesus said the sinful heart produces deceit. Our hearts are prone to deceit. But when Jesus changes our hearts, honesty fills our lives. If you have a problem with lying before you become a child of the living God, you should notice that lying is difficult after you have the Holy Spirit living in you. He said that the sinful heart produces sensuality. This is a life that has no restraint. Whatever feels good, do it. But when Jesus changes your heart, you begin to grow spiritually. And you get sensitive and realize that you want to live a life that honors God. Jesus said that the sinful heart produces envy. But when Jesus changes our heart, we begin to celebrate what others have. Jesus said the sinful heart produces slander. But when Jesus changes our heart, we begin to respect others and rejoice in the image of God we see in them. Jesus said the sinful heart produces pride, but the gospel says that Jesus Christ cleanses us with his own blood. There in your notes, Jesus said that he came to earth to rescue us from our unclean hearts. Jesus also said that he would make us clean by dying in our place and rising from the grave. Jesus said that whoever believes in him will receive a new heart and they'll be clean, truly clean from the inside out. And so what can be done about our defiled hearts? 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Paul very clearly said, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In our passage this morning, very clearly, Jesus is trying to show how we're defiled. The reason why is because we were not fully devoted to God and God alone. And let me go back to that statement I said when I first started. The wicked think their sin is nothing. The moral think that their sin is small. And the religious think that their sin is manageable. There in your notes, religion always promotes self-effort and turns people into hypocrites. But relationship with God through Jesus Christ gives life. So what can be done about our defiled hearts? It has everything to do with being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to end with this statement by Kyle Eidelman out of his book, Not a Fan. Fans have a tendency to confuse their knowledge for intimacy. They don't recognize the difference between knowing about Jesus and truly knowing Jesus. And in church, we've got this confused. We establish these systems of learning to teach us all this knowledge, but we don't have an intimate relationship with the Lord. Once you intimately know my Jesus, then you will love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It can't happen from knowledge and it can't happen from works. It's through the washing of Jesus Christ that cleanses all my sin. And he promised to give me a new heart if I would simply by faith receive his free gift and respond to him. Again, religion defiles, but a relationship makes us free to love him and worship him. And once we receive that free gift of salvation by faith, we're promised new life. We're promised eternal life and freedom that you can't believe. All those things that the old heart wanted are all fulfilled in Christ. So now as we go back into worship, my encouragement to you is this. Jesus Christ paid it all that we might have relationship with him. Not that we would use grace as a license to sin, that we would be one of these sloppy grace people that we just take advantage of, of the blood that he shed for us, but rather that we would rest knowing that he loved us so much that he was willing to be brutalized and put on that cross so that our sins would be forgiven and now we could be free to live for him, not free to, to use it as a license, Rather, live for him full on. Once again, let's pray one more time and then let's go worship the king. Thank you for listening and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithclamath.com. Make sure if you haven't already to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed.